overnight 1.5 million people have fled um, essentially into the region that we had, we'd moved to. Um, so what was what was going to work uh, to be working in some community development work with um, with uh, those that were affected by the, the, se the several wars, the civil war within a, within Iraq, as well as the wars between Iran and Iraq and other conflicts that had happened, turned into overnight. How are we going to help and serve refugees that are coming onto our doorstep? Here? Tim Buxton. Welcome to the Justice Matters Podcast. Hey, <laughs> yeah, well, it's good to be on my own show. What can I say? You're on the receiving end today yes. of the questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those listening at home or watching indeed, mm -hmm. this is a video podcast as well about Justice Matters. And I am Ben and I'm the best mate that Tim has ever had. Yeah, man, we go way back and... We're more brothers. Yeah, I would say there probably isn't anyone else. I would want introducing me then. Look, I know that's a nice thing to say and and you, maybe you mean it. You. But, mate, I really am looking forward to getting into talking about what this podcast is all about. I know that from your personal, mm. uh, who you are, because, um, you know, we go by, way back to, what, 12-year-olds, uh, uh, we met, um, and our journeys have intersected at different times and then Goodness taken me. great distances apart, worlds apart, and then come back together, and here we are. And I know that the subject of this podcast is not just something you thought of during the COVID-19 um, pandemic <laughs> when you're at home twiddling your thumbs, because Mr. Tim Buxton, he is never, he is never bored he is never not doing anything. He's never scratching his head thinking, geez, what am I going to do today? Never. Uh, this has been uh, quite a number of years in the making. Mm -hmm. And I know it's particularly important to you um, because of what it enables, the conversations and stuff around social mm -hmm. justice. Um, so shall we uh, get into what, why, why a podcast and why justice matters? Yeah. First of all, I do want to say, you know, it is, I think, fitting for you to, to kind of talk to me about why I'd even start a podcast because how, I can't think of how many things we've done together over the years. And, um, you know, whether it be playing sports together or working together, how many jobs from paper runs together to working in delis to in New York together. Mm. And now... Funnily enough, here we are um, working on podcasts and doing media stuff together once again. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's kind of special for me to have you as a part of the production team and helping to, to kick this thing off. So um, I'm pretty excited. Why a podcast? Um, well, obviously, um, yeah, this isn't something that's just kind of come up last minute. I was thinking about... Um, doing a podcast a couple of years ago when I first came back from Iraq when I was living with my family there for, for a few years. And then we kind of kind of got, you know, pulled up out of there pretty quickly, came here mm. um, to Australia, and I wasn't really sure what was next for me. And one of the things I really felt like I, I wanted to do was start talking to my friends that I'd been so inspired with along the years doing incredible work around the world mm. and to just talk with them and interviewing them. And, and as you say, more recently, um, as it kind of came down to like, well, well what, what theme, what, what, how, how are we going to like, you know, put some flesh and bones to this idea of a podcast? It, it was resounding this, this whole issue of justice. Mm. It's been an issue for me in my life. I've been passionate about really um, fighting for, for those that are oppressed and, and loving them well. Um, and so, yeah, Justice Matters kind of came about. You know, man, mm. when you say that, um, I it just makes me think back to, you know, we used to muck around quite a bit and, <laughs> and we, we had quite a competitive relationship oh, yeah. growing up and um, there were times that... Uh, it got quite heated. It did. 
Hey, and we're still competitive still, I think, in, in, we are. in subtle ways. We are, yes, and we're still, trying to, days. Yeah, we're still trying to get the best of competitiveness out of uh -huh. each other yeah. uh, in healthy ways. In healthy ways, ways yes. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't always go right, but, no. you know. But, you know, I can remember we, we used to do have the – you could – you probably can still buy them, but the plastic basketball hoops that you'd put up, oh um, my hang on, goodness, a, yeah, <laughs> on, on Venetian blinds or whatever inside the house. And there was yeah. this rumpus room that you had in your yes. house, remember? Oh it was a nice God. big room that was just kind Massive. of there's a piano in there, there was lounges, there was the TV, there was desks and lots of things, and there was enough space uh, if we moved some things to create an indoor basketball um, NBA jam oh type of God. thing. <laughs> But we used to slam each other up against the glass doors. Yeah, I think we would put mattresses up against the glass doors oh. so that we could totally... Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Like, yeah. We could slam each other even harder. Play one-on-one. -on -one. I, I don't know how those doors didn't break. But, um, yeah, we used to... It was definitely not... Yeah. Uh, basketball's intended to be a non-contact sport, man. Mm-hmm. Certainly wasn't when we played it. And uh, I can remember, I can just remember um, oh, maybe man. sometimes uh, something would happen. And uh, I remember your passion for the fairness of the rules. And if somebody would break them it, it, uh, or, or somebody would have a different you know, opinion about um, what happened, yeah. your passion rose up for fairness. Mm. And I don't know, that just popped in my mind when you were talking about it. And maybe we can allude to that mm. in your journey yeah, definitely. about really, you know, how this really sense of, of justice and that uh, and fairness mm. um, and helping those oppressed um, yeah. come about. It's part of your nature, but also part of um, your story as well. Yeah. Look, um, I think right now we see a lot of justice issues that get highlighted and there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misconceptions, I think, about justice issues. There's a lot of controversy, you know. Um, people tend to get pretty passionate, as I can be quite passionate myself, about mm. what I believe is right and fair. And, and um, you know, and, and, and of course right now we've got, um, you know, systemic racism and uh, quite often immigration and refugee issues that have really kind of risen to the forefront right now are, are really kind of issues that um, that are, are kind of hot button things right now. But there's so many other issues that um, that that there that are out there that I feel like I have so much to learn and so much to to be um, in, informed upon. Um, there's also incredible people out there. Now, I've had the privilege of meeting, of knowing people I respect dearly. They've got skin in the game that are doing incredible things to fight. There's so many injustices that, that unfortunately our world is plagued with right now. Um, so I'm, passion, I'm passionate about um, giving, giving voice to that, to learning. Um, um, it, you know, I want, I've found that the, the most, um, most of the time that I've really grown in, in, in my views and understanding of things is when I've when I've humbled myself to be in the listener seat and just to listen mm -hmm. and to learn um, and um, you know yeah I, I can quite often be passionate about what I think I know at the time but um, but yeah it's what I hope that's what I really what I hope it, again out of this podcast is that people will uh, find a safe place, a welcome place to come, to learn, to listen. Mm. Um, you know, we're on this journey. None of us have it all together. None of us have all the answers. None of my guests will have all the answers. Um, and so, you know, there's grace, right? There's grace mm. to, to, to learn and to grow in that journey. So that's really one of the, the things I really want this podcast to be, you know. Um, and most of those exciting things, the first season is really an engagement with a lot of my friends. Um, hence why I had to have you on. Oh, I get it now. As the first episode. No. I get it now. So just dear friends, people I, I really respect, people yeah, I awesome. love, people I know, um, they're not just hot air. They really have, have really made, made a difference and uh, continue to do that. So what is it? I want to get into your of your journey and mm -hmm. um, and where you've been, and then, and then you belong, of course, and some of those initiatives that you've been a part of. But... Um, mm. Let's just kind of 
we're talking about the podcast itself yeah. and, and what do you hope that people will get out of listening? Yeah. So hopefully you'll feel like you can come in and, and listen and, and, and really engage with the conversations that, mm. that I have. Um, I really hope in the process though, you'll kind of be con- confronted a little bit, you know, that you will, um, it'll get a bit uncomfortable um, because, you know, there's, there's nothing easy um, listening to gross injustices around the world and I think getting a close-in view, listening to personal stories, um, listening to how maybe you unknowingly have contributed to the injustice and the suffering of others um, and ways we can, all, we can all do better. So um, if you're up for it, I hope, I hope you don't mind if, if things get a little bit uncomfortable Mm. Um, and, and I've, I've found I've only ever grown when I've been willing to get uncomfortable and w- mm. been willing to challenge maybe the, the views that I've had or even, even the echo chamber I've quite um, often lived within where I find people around me that just believe what I believe and reinforce what I believe and, mm. and or what I think I know. And so, you know, again, these are people I trust. These are voices that I, I believe are, are real leaders and, and have... Um, have made lots of sacrifices doing what they're doing. So, mm. yeah, I hope you be confronted. But then, so I also want it, though, to be a hopeful podcast in mm. the sense that at the end of, of maybe being um, drawn into some very difficult conversations, some confronting, conflicting mm. issues um, uh, that really deal with human suffering, I still want people to be inspired, really, that there are incredible people out there making an incredible difference that it actually isn't that hard that we can make a difference even with little changes little adjustments to our lives that we can actually um, make a remarkable difference in in someone's life and I really want people to feel like um, after listening to an episode that they they really are going to be inspired to fight for a world where everyone belongs and and for me that means where everyone has the opportunity to experience justice and freedom and compassion um, and that to me really is is the hope that we go out there not just listen to some interesting stories and and kind of you know um, get enlightened just a little bit but really you know we we go out there ready to to act to do something about it and um, and I and I know from the guests that we've got you know you're going to be you can be ready to, to go out there and, and make a difference. Uh, I know I've been inspired by them, and so I, I'm excited to share those those guests and, and these conversations with, with everybody. Yeah, I've had a sneak peek <laughs> at the guest list, and it's it's pretty juicy. Mm. Some yeah. really amazing people with just an amazing perspective, experience, mm. and, and heart. And um, I, uh, you know... What you're talking about is is surely a world uh, that we really fundamentally all want, want, mm. and if, totally. most if not all of us, um, a place where everyone belongs, a place where people are heard, listened to, yeah, um, a place where if someone has and someone doesn't, um, mm. that we can share. And mm. um, you've alluded to some of the the crises we have at the moment, sure, um, and so often, unfortunately these issues of social justice, they just, they become you know, political, they become polarized. Right. We get we get a left and right hmm. and which have their place. And I think that's essentially, you know, your message, but wh- where does it go? How do we move this? How do we move right. it into an area that goes right and, yeah. and we, we make progress? Yeah, like for me, it's kind of always, um, it's always come down to this this concept and, and it's something I've really only been, I think, aware of more recently um, is is a lot of the dominating um, voices out there, whether it be in the media or in politics or um, that seem to dominate the airwaves today, um, tend to be dominated by very negative emotive forces. Um, and by that I mean... Um, you know, whether, like you said, there's the right or the left, there's the conservatives and the progressive or liberals, and, and we kind of box extremes. But they've both tended to use very similar negative emotions to kind mm. of propel their message across. Uh, for example, on the left, 
you know, if, if you have a viewer opinion that might be different to somebody else um, or to, to what maybe someone on the left might might espouse to, and it's, it's always funny to me that right, left, like I might be left of you, but I'm probably right of somebody else. So mm. it's a very subjective thing to be anyway. Mm. Like no one thinks that they're either left or right. They, they think they're in the middle somehow, some way. Right. Let's just use this kind of binary language if we have to. But, mm. you know, if I'm left, to, um, if I'm right of where someone left is thinking, there's a great temptation and we see it in the media to shame oh you must you know how could you think okay. that you're mm. you're you're a bigot or you're you're intolerant or you're whatever the case might be and, and we use lots of strong language mm. um, some of it quite honestly is warranted yeah? yeah if you come out and say pretty nasty things you, you deserve to be called out um, but there's this intolerance there's this inability to and so what I see is right this this use of shame and 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 um, you know just real negative emotion to propel your point. But on the right hand of the equation, you've got um, fear being the other negative emotion, and this idea that look, if we if we help or if we let certain people in to our community, or we let people in to our country, or if we let certain things to change, mm. then watch out. It's everything's going to fall apart, and the fabric. There's this fear domination um tactic really mm. that yeah i will i'll i don't know no one likes to be uh felt to feel that sense of fear in them so they'll do whatever they can to kind of align with that mm. that view and and to me it's just it's just it's just so sad i've never done anything i don't think in my life good um or remarkable when i've been led by shame or fear None of those emotions have really served me very well. Mm. Um, and what I would wish, what I'd hope for is that, and this is to me at the heart of what justice is, right? Mm. Is that we would be led by courage. We would be led by compassion. We'd be led by forgiveness and um, kindness. I mean, to me, these these beautiful positive emotions yeah they can have some fight to them hmm. they can have some some yeah, some heart to them a, a not talking over, about so. flakiness here hmm. um some of the most courageous brave strong people i've ever met are incredibly kind hmm. and humble um and so so i believe those are the emotions that should lead us forward as we tackle tackle issues that rightly so is it just the most gross injustices in society, things that have been there for a lot, far too long that we allow to be there. And you, we need to highlight these things, but we need to. Le- I think we need to lead with those kind of positive, forward-looking emotions um, that lead and drive us. And I know whenever I've done anything of, of worth in my life, it's always been because I've been able to, to you know, to kind of um, be led by, by those Mm. those emotions yeah and i mean how do, how do we how do we break those <laughs> th- those you know negatively negative motivations and go to positive i think what maybe we're doing here and mm. you're doing here with justice right. matters is talking about it is allowing the conversation it, it, mm-hmm. it involves listening it mm. involves you know you, you don't never learn anything or you never really grow by talking you, you grow by right listening and and then you get faces to a name and you get you know um you get faces to an experience and in this longer form you're able to understand um probably more so than a quick two minute twitter or or or, or facebook rant or wouldn't you say like that's the one thing i find that i've struggled with social media and i'm not always using it well but you, you say something and it gets weaponized so quickly or it gets jumped on yep. and suddenly there's this debate back and forth yep. and you you know if you've ever got caught into in a Facebook feud or whatever oh, it is it's like yeah. it's like ah oh, getting so misunderstood because I'm you just kind of going at each other and but you're right like that's the beauty of you know of, of maybe a podcast what I love about being able to sit down in longer form and chat with people is conversations man it's it's where you, 
you kind of really do get the opportunity to really learn about somebody. And, and there's a quote um, that, um, you know, well-known author, um, a psychologist, uh, Brene Brown, mm-hmm. has, has – um, and she says that it's hard to hate somebody up close. Mm. It's this idea of like when I get to know somebody's story, when I really get up close and personal with them, um, I can't, I can't have indifference or mm. hate towards you anymore. Mm. You will cross over into compassion mm. and empathy yep. and understanding. And isn't that what this world needs more than ever? Is this mm. ability to to just to listen to somebody? Or <laughs> if I could use an, an example. Um, and um, and uh, this incredible incredible guy that I, I've known um, know personally, I, I, I wrote again one of those issues where you write, you write a, f- a post on Facebook, and I was highlighting um, uh, the the recent protests that were happening in Australia with their, that had to do with Aboriginal lives matters and and um, deaths in custody, mm. and you know this person remarked in my comment said, look. Um, like, isn't that where the protests burned the Australian flag? And I, I know it was a really well, well-meaning, well-meaning comment. Mm. And I know that because I know this person to be such a wonderful, kind-hearted um, person. But to then be able to say, look, I remember just thinking about what that was said. Or how do we reconcile? It's a very tricky issue. Yeah, like these aren't simple black and white no. often issues. And I thought, well... What I'd love to do is I'd love to sit with whoever may have burnt that flag, the Australian flag. Yep. And I'd want to hear from them why did they mm. feel so angered and I don't know what pain in them, what what was it yep. that was rage that was in them or whatever emotion they had that would make them do that. I'd want to listen to them, find out why, hear their story. I bet I'd probably learn a thing or two about them and maybe I wouldn't be so... Um, outraged at, at what such an unpatriotic act that that could be and i think if all of us could maybe do that um well, they say we've got two ears right for a reason and one mouth and um mm. if, all, if we could be more inclined to i'm saying this to myself to stop to humble myself a little bit and listen and learn mm. i think we could um yeah create a world totally where where everyone feels valued um, heard, um, and, uh, you know, much fairer, beautiful yeah. society. Yep. It's time. Yep. <laughs> totally. So what I would really like to, um, hear now is, um, is your journey. I mm. mean, you've taken on, um, a, a sense of a, a drive to, to create a world where everyone belongs. That's Mm -hmm. the catchphrase of this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, You're, you have a, a, um, initiative here, a charity here called you belong. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's a fundamental belief. And can you Mm -hmm. tell us a bit about your journey? Mm. Um, not just, um, screaming for justice, um, playing basketball for, (laughs) uh, against me. Yeah. Um, but, um, how did you find yourself here with this, you know, yeah. what was it that kind of created this DNA for you mm. of, uh, of social justice and belonging? Mm. Yeah. Um, it wasn't long ago. Um, I was listening to a podcast and it, the guest just said, look, what, what's your core conviction that you have in your life? You know, mm. what, what is it? Um, and I had to stop and think about that for a little bit, as you do. It's quite a profound question. What would I say is a real core conviction? And and I just couldn't escape from from this sense of, you know, everyone belongs. I want everyone to feel welcomed. I want mm. when people come into my world, my stratosphere, whoever they are, I want them to feel loved. I want them hospitality is huge on on in my family. When you come to a house, we just it's all about creating an environment of just hospitality and welcoming, welcoming people, um, and loving people. Hopefully, without agenda, irrespective. Mm. You know, I, I grew up, um, as you know, Ben. Mm. Um, in uh, I was born in Indonesia, in another country, and my parents were missionaries um, in um, in Indonesia, in particular in in this place called West Papua, which is the um, uh, uh, Indonesian province of Papua 
and um, it, um, you know, amongst a, a jungle, highland, um, uh, ethnic mm. um, group, um, the Dani people. Um, I was a little little kid um, there. I don't remember, have much memories. Um, but my parents, I, I think I was instilled from a very young age uh, uh, um, to have parents that that just loved people and welcomed them too. I mean, I can even remember most Christmases that we would have, and this was when we'd moved back to Australia. I can remember uh, we would have someone from the local, like, low-security prison system in our home sharing Christmas with us. Like, Christmas wasn't just this sacred personal family thing. It was where even the prisoners... um, um, locally down the road <laughs> deserve to be in our home um, I'm so thankful and proud of of that kind of heritage we always had people from all over the world staying in our home and I loved obviously felt uh, you know as a third culture kid myself um, was never really felt like um, I belonged one place mm. it's probably spurred the fact that oh, I've I've kind of travelled the world and lived all in various countries, even taking dragging my family with me, uh, they've willingly um, come with me. At least my wife, the kids don't have a choice. <laughs> but Not you know, yet. yeah, exactly. And so, um, yeah, so I think that core value in me has been, you know, how beauty and beautiful and wonderful um, this world is, and how much. Um, we all need to feel that sense of love and belongingness. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of like, obviously it ca- became natural when mm. when we moved back to Australia after working with refugees in northern Iraq to, to, to um, really be passionate about helping refugees that were settling in Australia feel that same sense of belongingness, that they belong here, that they're, they're not just... Um, not just as peripheral members of society, but as Australians, as as the very heart. Uh, this is their place, home, mm. as much as it is mine. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to do when you're a foreigner, when you don't know the language, when you when you've experienced incredible trauma, and you've lost everything. Uh, it's 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 so difficult. And so yeah, so that's kind of where. You know, there's obviously a lot of places we've we've gone and I've gone and worked in um, yeah. over the years, but. But yeah. Do you want to, uh, you know, people can obviously read your story in different places on yeah. the internet and you have it, but do, do you want to go into uh, and briefly touch on where it kind of started for you from your personal journey? You said you were born into a yeah. missionary family, grew up as a, uh, a, a PK or yeah. pastor's, pastor's kid, kid yeah. in a church and that's where we met. Totally. Um, and I, right from the very start, there was always a strong sense of... Um, Mm. Of, of purpose that you had and mission that you had and mm. um, and it was just part of who you were. Um, mm. And then uh, it was around the time, what, 20, 22, no, 22 or something. Around 22, yeah. I got married and mm. then you were like, well, the, well, you know, my best mates got hitched. So... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you just kind of took the first opportunity, right? You'd found someone, to... ditched me and right. I needed to go and, and obviously... Find, a find my own wife. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> Might as well I try go America. to America. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, can you just explain a little bit about that um, that work there, and then how that led to mm. living in Iraq? Because that that's a story, and we could we could go on. Yeah, yeah. Quite a bit. Um. So yeah, I, I moved to New York. I was yeah, I forget now. It was two thousand four, I believe, uh, when I first um, moved there. I travelled there. Uh, once or twice before on a round the world ticket. Um, what, um, what did you like about that opportunity? Yeah. What was it? So it was to work at a church called Times Square Church in the heart of New York City, and they had a massive, massive emphasis and focus um, on helping you know, the gangs of New York back in its early days. Yeah, David. But Wilkerson. also David Wilkerson, yeah, rode the cross and the switchblade. Which for if if you're a Christian and uh, um, maybe. Maybe a, a little older because, you know. Um, yeah, I remember reading that book. Yeah. I went to a state school here, a public school, mm. as you'd call it. And um, I remember it was on the list of like in, in grade nine or whatever, books to read, you know. Yeah. And I remember reading that then. Hugely and, influential book. Mm. And, and just like a remarkable 
story of someone who wanted to go into the heart mm. of some of the most dangerous um, communities in New York and and bring hope and light and love and uh, the message of Jesus. And so, you know, for me, um, growing up in um, as a pastor's kid and faith being and my Christian faith being such an important motivator for me. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, I, I was really excited to have this opportunity to go and intern in New York City at this church. Um, and uh, it was it was an incredible opportunity. I ended up staying there for 10 years. I met my wife, Sarah. But the job was really, for me, it was a dream job. I got to, to coordinate short-term trips that would go around the world, whether it be doing medical trips or construction trips or working in slums or in um, red light districts or, or homeless in and drug addicts in Colombia. Um, I got to coordinate these trips. I got to go and, and, and build and create these trips and, and lead them and train people that would go on them and how to best serve in these contexts. Um, you know, because f- for me personally, um, um, uh, that really was what, for me, Jesus was all about. Jesus was about going to the the those that are on the out of society, um, everyone loved in in the, in the Bible, they would call them sinners, which was really just code word for you just you're just not good enough. You're on the you know whether you got leprosy and you and you smell and you you've diseased and you've obviously brought that upon yourself somehow in some way, mm. or whether um, whether you're um, you know, um, right, you cut off, cut um, off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You you were ostracized. Mm. Yet it seemed that's all Jesus cared about was being with those kinds of people, and telling them, "You're already in." Mm. <laughs> telling them, uh, "You're you're in my books. I've got this big circle mm. called grace, and you're on the inside of that, and you are you're welcomed and you're loved, and in fact, it's." quite often the people that were pointing the fingers and making everyone else feel like they weren't good enough, that he was very frustrated and angry um, and, you know, um, passionately against. And so... So that sounds like a, not really a religious concept, but a... Yeah, exactly. Just a, a, a fundamental concept of how we work together best as humanity. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh I, um, you know, one of the the verses um, in Scripture that has stood out to me over the years was um, there's a couple of them, and they both they're both quotations that Jesus says using another prophet from long ago, a prophet called Isaiah, very well known prophet in Hebrew Scripture and in the Old Testament writings, and he. Uh, the first one is when Jesus got up and said, you know, um, uh, the Spirit of God is on me because he's, he's, he's got his hand on me. He's anointed me to, to bring good news to who? To the poor, to the blind, to those in prison, to the out, all the outskirts, to those who are mm. mourning, to those that are suffering. Mm. I've come here to tell you this is your year come here to give you joy where there's sadness to to bring freedom when there's shackles of bonds on you and to me that seemed to be so central to all that Jesus was about and I really I think I've that for me has been what has I've so um wanted to be my life's kind of Mm. um calling especially growing up um and um wanting to to go into parts of the world which which seemed to me to be so so um so much suffering going on and so much yeah. pain and so much heartache and then the last verse which uh, you know um is where Jesus says look um he talks about his own kind of approach to 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 serving and loving people it's like a bruised reed uh, um he will not break and a flickering flame he will not snuff out. In other words, those people that are bruised and broken and bent over, there is no way that God or or anyone who's doing his work 
those are the ones we should go up after to help to to be there. Most people will just write it off and be like, yeah, mm. you're not you're not important. Mm. And then the flickering flame, right? This flame that's ready to just snuff out. And instead, he's like, no, these are the ones we had to go to to help to lift up to to breathe new life into till that flicker becomes you know a flame again. And so. Um, it's kind of been, you know, really at the heart of who I am and really what I believe the heart of what it is to, to, to live out my faith. Mm. So I know your story, of course, but from there you go with a family of three yeah, and you decide, uh, I don't know how, but you decide sure. with your wife and obviously a step of faith. Yeah. Um, sense of yes, this is this is right for us. And mm. I think maybe from a faith background, you had that sense of, of comfort that, yeah, this is a, this is a, a sense of calling. Mm. And, um, you know, when you have a, a faith background, that can really assist in, in, um, in getting beyond the fear and going, <laughs> you know, and going, yeah, uh, I'm going to step into this. You know, right. I believe in the nature of the great sense of the, purpose. Yeah. yeah, and the nature of the universe uh, as a as benevolent, as inclusive, mm. as um, for those who are mm. who are stepping out and 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 seeking to make you know build bridges and and mm. um, make great great change. You know, mm. and so you decided with you. I mean, you, you actually landed in Iraq. Yep. Northern Iraq, mm-hmm. and you're like, incidentally, that was the day that ISIS right invaded. invaded. Yeah, so what did that feel like? Yeah, how did it happen? What did that feel like? Yeah, I mean, the process of getting to Iraq, as you c- can imagine, wasn't just something that was like, oh, Sarah, let's go to Northern Iraq. She was, uh, I think, pregnant um, with our first child when I first went to Iraq and really was like, oh my gosh, this is a place that people can go and help. Mm. It's not a place, it's not a no-go zone. You just can't not go there. And and there were other families that were there that I was like, wow, other families are living here. This is possible. Maybe I can come along and help. And obviously it's a place where not many people wanted to go. And so that was back in 2010. Um, 10 years ago uh, and so yeah it took a while though for Sarah to kind of warm to the idea and mm. and it was always a decision that we made together and I waited I think uh, three years before we ended up moving there after first indicating hey this was something mm. that I'd actually be interested in doing mm. so we get there like you said ISIS invades the city of Mosul uh, just a 45 minute drive away from the 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 airport that we flew into and landed at. No one had heard of ISIS. They were just a ragtag rebel group in Syria at the time. And then suddenly they uh, rise to notoriety uh, through their blitzkrieg into Iraq um, and capturing so much, huge amounts of of land there. And in in particular, the city of Mosul, which uh, was the second largest city in Iraq and had weapons and they had captured oil fields and and it was just a a time where i think over overnight 1.5 million people have fled um essentially into the region that we had we'd moved to um so what was what was going to work uh to be working in some community development work with um with uh those that were affected by the the several wars the civil war within a within Iraq as well as the wars between Iran and Iraq and other conflicts that had happened turned into overnight how are we going to help and serve refugees that are coming onto our doorstep and and um, you know are, are, are currently mm. going through genocide and mm. other other immense sufferings and so it was like you said that sense of you know like maybe this is why we're here this is mm. this is god's got us here for mm. this reason mm. kind of kicked in and and we went through some highs and some lows some incredible challenges uh, up a, uh, an, uh, um, a time where we had to to leave quickly um and and evacuate the country to then coming back in and and really then launching into the work um which 
was called the Refuge Initiative. We started um, an initiative of the organisation I was with that really dealt with uh, providing um, um, uh, housing and education and trauma care um, to these families that um, that were in desperate need. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, gosh, um, it was probably the most wonderful years of my life as well as the most difficult years. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Now, now here in Australia, mm. um, obviously you, you had to up and leave there for different circumstances, different mm. situations, um, but, um, or reasons I should say. Mm. And, and how did that then lead to you then starting You Belong over here? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it was a very difficult decision to leave. We really didn't have a lot of time to make up the mind, I think, our mind to leave when we did. Um, we got on one of the last flights out of out of Iraq before the airports all shut down in that country for, I think it was almost six months. Why was that? Um, well, there was... Because um, of unrest. Yeah, so what had happened was mm. is, is the northern region where we were in Kurdistan had voted for independence and that really didn't make... Uh, southern iraq very happy because they'd be breaking away if they followed through with that syria and turkey and iran were very nervous because if any of if that went through then the kurdish population which lived there's almost 50 million of them there's 50 million kurds they don't have their own state they're scattered predominantly within those four countries mm. or it would have made all those countries feel nervous that an up an uprising and 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 a and a, a breaking away of wanting independence in those regions would would follow suit and so basically all borders into our region were shut with all these nations they kind of put the squeeze and said look if this is what you're going to vote for then we're going to all make it very difficult for you and my wife Sarah was pregnant with our baby number 4 and there was a real there was a progression in our work that we were hoping to hand it over to to locals and there was mm. a plan that that within a uh, couple of years we would be able to leave and, and just uh, leave the flourishing work over to the locals that were yeah. doing that and so I guess with everything that went on it was like well I guess we're just now's a good time to leave and it was the hardest I mean I never wept so much and even memories of it still kind of mm go a bit deep there and um but yeah so yeah so we ended up coming back to australia and i i honest, quite honestly ben i you know i was depressed i was a bit of at a loss um i felt like i was just in my element serving there um mm. but i found out i don't know how now that that families yazidi families families from iraq and syria that had um had now been granted you know refugee visas to come and live in Australia and there was a town nearby Toowoomba three hours of where I was living at the time and I just got in my car as soon as soon as I could drove up to see and try and meet with some of these families and meet with the community members that were trying to help them and mm. I just wanted to somehow be a part of that and so that really was the the beginnings of 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 starting you belong um and um what it's become today which which I look back on now, and I think in the, the couple short years that it's been um, going, it's just thriving, and uh, I've got an incredible team that I, mm. I, I'm really kind of at the in the background, um, just kind of cheering th them on as they as they do wonderful things to to help these families just feel loved and and really empower them. Really, they uh, are just it's just wonderful. Yeah. Mm. It, uh, one of the things about you, Tim, it really inspires me, it warms my heart to see how you embrace um, others and differences, different people, mm -hmm. different cultures, and um, mm -hmm. I've certainly seen you do that for these Yazidi people mm -hmm. and uh, the Kurds. And w what are some of the things? Like you have a you have picnics up there at Toowoomba, yeah. um, celebrations and... And you know our our family barbecues or barbecues as Aussies are, are pretty pretty lame. Pretty lame, right? Totally. I mean, there's no dancing unless there's too much alcohol, you know. <laughs> but these guys, what are some of the the, the things that you've just great things about that culture? Oh my goodness, they 
they are the most hospitable people I've ever met. Um, and, you know, I remember li- going back to living in Iraq. I remember coming back to the States for, I think, a two-week trip, mm. leaving my wife and kids in this small community where, I'd say small, 150,000 people in our town. There are only a, a couple of other Western families that were living in that town. Yeah. And I remember just, you know, just feeling so at peace leaving my wife and children behind there because I knew that probably every single day she'd be getting food dropped over at her house from the neighbours. They would check in on her. They would care for her like she was not only a guest, but she was like family. Mm. Um, you would go to eat and you could go to a, a Kurdish or uh, an Iraqi or a Syrian or anyone from the Middle East for that matter into their home and you would be treated like a king and you would eat the most incredible food there is on this planet. There would always be 10 times more food than you could, that would be for uh, the people in that room at the time. Mm. Um, it's because it's almost like they prepare a meal assuming that like three other families are going to be joining them that night. And so that's what these picnics are like. There's copious amounts of food uh, to make sure that everyone feels like, hey, of course there's there's a room at the table for you, of course. And that table is a sheet on the ground, kind of like this little rug here with food just plonked on it. And there's always room for anybody to sit at it. There's no set number of tables, a set, mm. set number of chairs at the, at the table. It's whoever wants to can come. And yeah, the dancing's rowdy. The music is loud. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like a, a rave party, loud dance m- music. Like and, speakers and distorting. Like, totally. And it's not playing unless it's distorting. And it's not. And it's not. And you've got to make sure you've you're prepared to lock pinkies with another bloke or girl if you're okay. a lady. Okay. And, and and jiggle your your uh, your shoulders. And uh, get the get the feet moving. Uh, us Aussies look like the most awkward bunch of robots trying to dance when we right. join in. But you don't have the, yeah. unless it's you, Ben, because you've kind of you got the moves like Jagger. Say? Or, it's, it's a pity this is an audio podcast. <laughs> exactly, it's just a, a heck of a lot of fun um, and a hospitality. Um, and that's, I guess it's what I miss even myself so much about the you know those the places I've had the, the um, privilege of living. Um, and I think, you know, I think that we as Australia have done a good job at, at welcoming people. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, we, you know, we will continue to do that in, uh, in so many ways. Yeah. Mm. And that's part of the, the real value here um, of listening and learning. Mm from other people hearing their stories yeah, um, and getting a sense of their culture. And I mean, we just, we, in, it's a, uh, it enriches who we are. Mm. We've got so much to learn from each other. Mm. We do some things good here and some yeah, things not so good in our culture. Um, mm. But um, it's, it's beautiful when we can be welcoming, but we can also listen and learn and uh, mm. and and live together and appreciate each other's uh, mm. beauty. So, well, I'm lo- I'm looking forward to these stories. And yeah. you say you're interviewing friends. Yeah. Um. And but the friends that you have made. Yeah. I mean, Tim, I, I have to mention this. You've been in GQ magazine, which <laughs> which I, I'm still a bit. You know, in our you're history of competitiveness. Of that, um, I'm not, I don't, not sure how I'm going to up that one, but oh. uh, I'm sure you could go, the listeners could go online and, and Google GQ and Tim Buxton. Don't. Right. And they could read that. <laughs> Look, um, it's probably some nice pickies in there mm, too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're making me blush, Ben. <laughs> I would say this. Um, I do have some, uh, great, great friends. I've got people that I've, I've looked up to, um, over the years, I've been um, so blessed to know um, that you'll be meeting uh, so inspiring mm. people that have have informed me and led me to become uh, a better person. Mm. Um, and I think too to 
artists that have made me realize that they've believed in me as well. Mm. People that have supported me and my work and, and, and my passions. I'm really grateful um, that they've um, agreed to come on yeah. on this um, project that I have. Yeah. I really hope um, it'll have the opportunity to span a few seasons and, and really continue to be a place like I said, where where we can all learn together on this journey of making this place, um, this world that we call home, um, where ev- a place where everyone belongs. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm super, super excited. Awesome. Now I have to ask because this is a question that you ask all your guests. Oh. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great one to finish off mm. um, because, you know, there's going to be, you know, people listening that, may have a sense that yeah I, I believe in a world a just world and I believe that I you know fundamentally that I need to make other people's problems my problem as well mm. um, but then you know a lot of us like I have enough problems in my life you know I got well let's take it to me personally four kids mm. Mm. you know what that's like I've got a uh, mortgage no I haven't got a mortgage but you know I've got bills to pay I've got um Mm. troubles in my life um why do i need to go looking for problems and um why does the cause of justice matter to you and why should it matter why does it need to matter to every single human um great question <laughs> um yeah well <laughs> and i'm not expecting some <laughs> yeah some drop mic drop answer mic drop answer no mate. and, and just it doesn't have to be i don't think it doesn't have to be a mic drop and yep. so f- for me, it comes back to my core convictions, be, uh, and that is um, because we all belong. Hmm. Um, and the minute I say, um, you're worthy of love, you're worthy of acceptance, you're worthy um, to um, have your voice heard, um, you're worthy to have your dreams and, and passions um, to be pursued. Hmm. But somehow you're kind of not worthy. Mm. And I'm not willing to um, kind of do what it takes to make sure that everyone has the same opportunity mm. to experience freedom, that everyone has the same opportunity to experience compassion. Um, I, I don't want to make this a long-winded answer, but I think we, we all have, we're all complicated people. We all have issues we, we all essentially um, have things that w- would kind of like write us off the list of being worthy, so to speak, if we, if if truth be told. But that is not the truth. I think we all are worthy, and we all should um, we should be passionate. I should be passionate about using whatever opportunity and resources and and privilege um, to make sure that other people less fortunate than me um, have the same opportunities. So, and I think that's what's going to create a world, um, um, a build a world where we all, um, a more beautiful world, mm. <laughs> more wonderful world for us all to live in, for our children to live in. And mm. um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Well, mate, I'm subscribing. Good. For sure. You better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <better. laughs> At least, is there a way you uh, subscribe to just one episode? Like, cause I'll, I'll subscribe to this one. No, you can. It, it's a YouTube channel, uh, Justice Matters TV. So you can subscribe and make sure whenever there's a new episode that drops. Um, yeah. You can also become a patron. You can help me. Pro- oh, how do produce I, this? Just talk briefly about yep. that. What's that about? Patreon. Uh, Patreon. dot com mm. forward slash Justice Matters uh, podcast, I believe, um, or Justice Matters. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure actually. I I get that right in the sh- in the sh- <laughs> in, in, the show notes. in real show notes. It'll yeah. be it'll be correct. I Check should know out. that. But this is um, a way to support. You can support just as little ways. as a dollar, a, dollar. As a month. I can do that. Yeah. I can do three of those. We can even get you on the on the highlights. Um, there's bonus uh, content that'll be up there for people to to listen to. Bonus questions for the Maybe guests. Maybe even of this interview. Exactly. You could even have a one on one Skype with me. If wow! You really? really want to, uh, mate? That's got to be worth become a, bit. a supporter of of the podcast. But uh, yeah, obviously we're on uh, Spotify and um, Apple Podcasts and uh, other various platforms out there as yep. well. Yeah. Um, so there's ways you can subscribe to to the the podcast there. So yeah, definitely get on it, share it with other people. 
if you've yeah. gained anything, I hope it, it'll be something that uh, you'd, you'd uh, want to share with your friends. and Yeah. And just subscribing, whatnot. I mean, is, is, is supporting um, mm. as well. It really helps in the, you know, the online world that we have. Um, yeah. If you believe in, in uh, what this is Getting about. Getting this message out. Yeah. yeah. Um, subscribe everywhere you can find a subscribe button. Yes, do it, please. Awesome. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, Tim. Mate, you're, I'm so proud of you mm. and the work that you've already done and your authenticity in your journey. I know this thing is not um, a fad mm. thing for you because I know you more than mm. anyone. We sometimes say that we have kind of the one, we have so many uh, experiences that I'm kind of, we have the sort of same consciousness. I know, I'm like. <laughs> we share yeah. so many of our, you know, um, as I said before, we yeah. have um, crossed paths and um, done journeys together very, very so often in life and mm. unexpectedly. Um, mm. But I know one thing that you're, this is authentic and you're an authentic person and, and you're not only um, for the cause of welcoming people, but you are a, a welcoming and uh, a person and uh, mm. somebody that even, you know, you talk about the Iraqis, they, you know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, going around watching the footy at your place the other day, you know, there was, there was food out on the tables, uh, you know, great, some great hors d'oeuvres, some variety, mm. some, you know, hey, come on, you know, stay for dinner. Mm. Um, it's just all part of your nature and I so mm. um, support you and uh, really thanks for letting me be a little bit of a part of it. Uh, thanks, Benny. Awesome. Well, hopefully there's a couple episodes already up, so jump on, listen to them. Do that. Yeah. Awesome. It's been fun, man. Thanks, mate. Thank you.